Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you guys for calling into the Preschool Development Grant Statewide Initiatives webinar. All right, everybody, we will go ahead and get started. And I'll share my webcam. All right, hi, everybody. I'm Courtney Wheelis. I'm the staff director for the Preschool Development Grant. And you all probably know me from my previous role at OEL as the DC r and manager. But I've, uh, back in January, I was able to get the opportunity to help guide this work. And I'm so excited to share with you all today. Um, with me today are um, to present on these projects are OEL subject matter experts that are guiding this work. They're drafting the grant contracts and are making all these projects come to life. And right here's our agenda. We're gonna go um, for today's webinar. I'm gonna provide you with a brief PDG overview. Then I'll pass it over to all the wonderful hardworking OEL staff that lead each individual project and we'll be providing you all with an overview. We'll have time at the end for questions and answers and then we'll wrap up and ensure you all have our contact information. If you have any questions about any of the projects, please feel free to reach out to me or the project lead. This is the um, first webinar in a two-part series. Um, again, to get you all up to speed on all things PDG. But we wanted to begin the webinar with giving you guys a PDG refresher. So as you know, in 2018, we applied uh, for and were awarded the first preschool development grant. We received 8.5 million for the first year's grant. And we we're lucky enough to be able to reapply and receive the PDGR, the PDG renewal. Uh, we were one of 20 states to receive the renewal grant. And so we'll be receiving about 13.4 million each year for the next three years. So it's exciting. Um, we'll help strengthen Florida's early learning and education care system. Um, so, and just to let you all know, just like everybody's projects and ways of work, um, PDG projects were impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we've had to pivot um, our approach to many of the projects you'll be hearing about today and even cancel some projects altogether, unfortunately. But we're hoping that we can move these projects into years two and three of the grant period. Next slide. All right, so just some more background on the grant. The grant is um, to support states in coordinating and aligning systems and services that already exist. So we want to improve program quality expand access to targeted professional development opportunities, uh, facilitate better partnerships between programs, improve transitions from early education and care programs into elementary school. We want to increase program operating and cost and efficiencies and expand parental choice and involvement. We want to ensure families are linked to the full range of services they need. Uh, next slide. As mentioned, the goal is to strengthen Florida's um, existing early education and care system. We can't do this work alone. PDG projects are guided by a state advisory council. And just so you know, they are responsible for leading the development and enhancement of the system. So we all have to work together to get there. Um, you know, representative of the council, we have um, partners from Head Start, IDEA, mental health programs, home visiting programs, Department of Health, and on and on. I have sent an invite out to our next meeting and am happy to report that I have got a lot of interest in the State Advisory Council and, and participation, so that's wonderful. Uh, next slide. All right, so the purpose of this webinar, besides to give you all of an overview of PDG, we want to make sure that you all understand each project, who the project's for, the time spent activities, expectations and outcomes, and my screen is cutting off the webinar, and talk about program leads. And since we have a lot, a lot to get through today, I'm going to pass the baton 
so to speak, over to Tamara Price. She's our early learning program and policy manager for school readiness. And without Tamara, we really couldn't get any of this work done. So I'm going to let her take it away. Great, awesome. So before I get started, well, I'm Tamara Price. I'm the early learning program and policy manager with school readiness. And I am happy to be here with you guys to, um, to share our webinar purpose. I wanna just pause for a second because we have a couple of chat messages that said that they can't hear. Um, if one, either Courtney or um, one of the other panelists can just unmute and tell us if you can hear before I continue. I can hear. You can hear, okay. All right, I well, I will. You can hear. Do okay, I need perfect. to go over anything again? I'm happy to do it. Okay, and or if they um, have questions, they can call me. So I did want to let you all know that this session is being recorded so that you will be able to access it later, um, just in case you missed any part of it while you were connecting or if you couldn't hear. Um, so, and also just to give you guys a disclaimer that we are recording this this particular webinar so that when we start the Q&A session, you know that um, when you unmute, you will be recorded. So if you can go to the next slide for me, Adia. So part of the webinar purpose is exactly what Courtney was explaining to you to give you those updates, timeframes, activities, and project leads. Um, these are broken up, these project activities are broken up over two webinars in our webinar series. We have five topics family support, inclusion, social, emotional, and mental health. And then for webinar two, we'll be going over professional development, which is very linked, and we have a lot of professional development opportunities going on, and then our system enhancements that we'll be making. And so um, it just gives you something to look forward to for webinar two. Um, but for this particular webinar, we will be doing family support, inclusion, social, emotional, and mental health. If you can skip to the next slide. So I'd like to just tell you what those particular subtopics are. Um, for family supports, we have online digital supports for families, which will be presented by Dr. Lisette Levy. Florida Healthy Kids Targeted Outreach, which will be presented by Adia Bradwell. Single Point of Entry and the Family Needs Assessment will be presented by Penny Norton. Home Visiting, um, the Resources Professional Development um, for ELCs. That will be presented by Linda Hockenberry. You can move to the next. Um, under inclusion, we have Autism Baby Navigator um, presented by Linda as well. We have the Work Group for Streamlining Services for Children with Disabilities and Tracking of Early Intervention and Screening. That's going to be presented by Dr. Lisette Levy, along with Inclusion Collaboration Summit, Pyramid Model Implementation, and the Racial Equity Initiative. And then our last topic for today will be the social, emotional, and mental health. And the first topic will be FSU 10 Components of Quality Infant and Toddler Care, um, presented by Monique Wilkinson. Infant Early Mental Health. Um, there are three or four projects underneath early um, Infant Early Mental Health that will be presented by Katie Dufford Melendez. And she will also be be presenting on our mental health and social emotional supports. So without further ado, we are going to move into our first topic, which is family support, and introduce you to our first presenter, Dr. Lisette Levy. Hi, everybody. Thank you for your attention. And for this first project, the task was to connect families with programs and services that meet their children's unique abilities. And you probably heard a lot during this COVID um, situation that many parents were desperate in their homes, not knowing what to do with their children. And even though there was, this was planned before COVID happened, um, this really came uh, just at the right time to provide parents with an app or an educational program that could help them uh, interact with their children. 
So the purpose, it was to support them in engaging their children at home. And it's going to be done through a pilot start study. We will be engaging HIPPI, which is homed at USF. And it's going to evaluate whether this is a good idea and if it's worth to expand for with more families. So the tools that we are going to be selecting are going to go through a procurement process. The next slide, please. The anticipated outcomes are uh, for families, of course, to have access to activities so they can support their children's learning. They also um, will have the access to an application that will be supporting the cognitive and social emotional development of their children. And on the other hand, it will be another tool for HIPPI, the program, Home Visitors, to use while interacting with families. So, um, so you understand it better, um, this pilot is going to start with a home visitor specialist from HIPPI when they go and they do their visits with the families that they serve. Next slide, please. At the beginning of um, the project, next slide, oh, there you go. Um, the idea it is to prepare the hippie home visitors. So they are going to be trained in how to administer a pre-assessment, which is going to be a few questions um, that they will be asking the parents that they work with. And um, that is going to be two hours and only for the home visitor specialist. And then they are also going to be trained on the online programs that will be selected. So they know how to guide the parents uh, when they go and they visit them and how to use them and um, where are things located in the app and how to access them, how to use it. They also will be trained in a pre and post assessment. So after they do the pre, and by the end of this um, period of the pilot, they're going to be implementing another post-assessment in a survey, and they have to be trained on how to do that. So the timeline for this project, it will be for this year um, preparing the home visitors. And then for next year, 2021, is when they are going to be um, using and helping parents get on the app. Um, and then they will assess everything by the end of 2021. Next slide, please. So the stakeholders are um, the hippie program and the families they serve. But um, we also want for you to know that OEL is engaged and USF is engaged. Um, from the coalition's point of view, we don't think any of you will be engaged at this point because this is just the pilot and we want to see if this is going to be good to be expanded in the future. If you have any questions, the OEL contacts are Sunny Sanders. And from um, the hippie program is Dr. Tracy Payne. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lissette. I appreciate that. Um, so we're going to move on to Florida Healthy Kids Targeted Outreach. Adia Bradwell from the CCRNR department. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Adia Bradwell, and no webcam for me as I'm navigating this PowerPoint here. Um, I am lead on the Florida Healthy Kids Targeted Outreach Project. And so the purpose of this project is to engage Florida Healthy Kids Corporation to work with the Florida Department of Education Office of Early Learning to provide targeted resources and outreach to families who access services from coalitions, Head Start, Early Head Start, or other mental health services and referral partners to 
increase access to Florida kid care programs, which will hopefully significantly increase enrollment in Florida kid care programs. So just a little background, um, there are nearly 2.4 million children who are enrolled in Florida kid care, representing 62% of Florida's children. However, there are at least 325,000 children who, are, who still remain uninsured in Florida. And 57% of these uninsured children are eligible for free or low cost coverage through Florida kid care. And the remaining 146,000 children are eligible for full pay coverages through Florida Healthy Kids or MediKids. So there are unfortunately many uninsured children in the state of Florida, and there's a great need for enrollment. And through our collective efforts, we will achieve the anticipated outcome um, that children will, will have improved physical and mental health that there will be an increase, hopefully significant, in the number of children enrolled in Florida kid care. Also, that there's a reduction in um, children who are uninsured and increased partnerships between Florida kid care and other services to expand access, increased health literacy to help families obtain and understand information and services to make physical and mental health decisions for their child. And our stakeholders are our CCRNRs, our school readiness and VPK <clears throat> um, staff members, Head Start, Early Head Start, our mental health services and family. As for activities and time frame, the contract details are still in development, so nothing quite set in stone yet. Um, anticipated date, uh, we anticipate having targeted outreach in this upcoming winter of 2020 and spring of 21, and we'll facilitate three outreach training webinars to coalitions who provide information for the school readiness, the VPK and CCR and our programs, and inclusion warm line, including OEL key partners, our key partners here. <clears throat> so just a little information about the proposed content for the webinars. So the webinars will cover ways that our early learning coalitions and partners can identify families who need health insurance. It will cover basic information about Florida Healthy Kids and eligibility requirements for Medicaid for children ages birth through 18. Then we'd have MediKids for children ages um, one through four. Then there's Florida Healthy Kids, which serves children ages 5 through 18, and the Children's Medical Services Managed Care Program for children with special health care needs um, ages 1 through 18. The webinars will address how our stakeholders and partners will connect families with Florida Healthy Kids, toll-free number, and online services. Also cover creative strategies to increase outreach and awareness for Florida kid care programs. More on anticipated dates. Uh, so we are aiming to facilitate one outreach training during OEL's virtual inclusion summit for October 2020 and collaborate with key partners to create a one 20 minute video by December 1 and collaborate with the State Advisory Council to submit a proposal describing how eligibility requirements, application processes, and eligibility determinations can be streamlined. And hopefully that by December 1 of 2020. Time commitment is not very significant. We will invite our stakeholders to attend one of three outreach training webinars, which should be two hours max, or um, they may attend the OEL's virtual inclusion summit. Um, two hours, which will cover, uh, two hours will be dedicated to cover the Florida um, Healthy Kids Outreach Project. And um, commit to providing ongoing so commit to providing ongoing outreach services to families when applicable. 
So the details are still not yet set in stone, but there will be guidance that will help our stakeholders identify families in need of health insurance, um, when to provide ongoing outreach or targeted outreach to families and so forth. And if you have any questions, feel free to contact me, Adia Bradwell. I'm happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you. All right, thanks, Adia. So we're gonna move on to single point of entry and family needs assessment with Penny Norton from the School Readiness Department. Thank you, Tamara. Hi, um, I'm Penny Norton and I'm the project lead for the single point of entry and its related activity, the family needs assessment. Through this project, Florida is exploring the development of a single point of entry system that would provide families the ability to go to one website and apply for multiple services, depending on their individualized needs, preferences, and eligibility. As this requires the collaboration and cooperation of many statewide agencies, the State Advisory Council, as Courtney mentioned in her opening, is considered a critical partner in this process. Building on the feasibility study that was done with the 2019 Preschool Development Grant, the Office of OEL is procuring a contractor to consult with Head Start, Early Head Start, and others with experience in the design and deployment of similar systems. In addition to consultation with experts, the contractor will also implement a family needs assessment survey to inform the single point of entry information portal. The family needs assessment will provide information to OEL on how families access services on a local and statewide level, identify additional services that may be needed, and collect information on how families with young children currently access relevant programs. After information gathering, the contractor will work with the State Advisory Council entities to design the initial phase for a single point of entry, along with an implementation plan for years two and three, including a detailed timeline and projected costs and common eligibility requirements of the numerous programs available. The single point of entry will be designed to integrate the work completed for the family mobile application, which you'll hear about in another slide, and based on results of the family needs assessment. Next slide, please. The anticipated outcome for this activity is that families will have a streamlined way to access the services they and their children need. Ultimately, users will enter some common eligibility criteria and then will be given information on services they qualify for and how to access those services. Stakeholders for this project are the children and families of Florida, the State Advisory Council, and the multiple statewide social service, social service agencies, including Head Start and Early Head Start. Next slide, please. Leadership is currently reviewing the proposals that uh, have been received from vendors and will be making a decision soon about that. So currently we do not have a vendor selected, but it's still in that procurement process. Um, the time frame for the start of this project will be as soon as a, a PO is issued to a vendor. And the project end date is currently set for December the 31st of 2020. The time commitment for the ELC will be minimal. The role for the ELC is to work with the contractor with requests from information, particularly about the, the family needs assessment. And also the contractor will be um, probably asking for you as coalition, you know, as the knowledgeable people in your area to identify a sample of families who are representative of the coalition service area. If you have any questions about the single point of entry or the family needs assessment, you can contact me or Courtney Willis. Thank you. Thanks, Penny. So we will move on then to home visiting with Linda Hockenberry from the School Readiness Department. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Linda Hockenberry. I'm the project lead for home visiting. And the purpose of this project, uh, we're collaborating with the Florida Department of Health, and the purpose is to expand access um, and information to families on home visiting programs in Florida while providing related professional development to early learning coalitions and partnering home visitors. Um, the anticipated outcomes 
families of English language learners, children with unique learning abilities, um, children at risk, as well as homeless and rural populations, will have access to information on the importance of engaging in activities to support their children's learning. Next slide. Um, families will learn how to use digital supports or applications to interact with their children while supporting cognitive and social and emotional development. And family home visitors will be able to engage families in using digital supports to enhance their children's learning on a regular basis. The stakeholders are Early Learning Coalition staff, specifically the CCRNR, Ounce of Prevention, the Florida Association of Healthy Heads, Healthy Start Coalitions, HIPPI, 211, Help Me Grow Florida, and Families. Next slide. The contract details are still in development. The anticipated dates are the training development would be by the fall of 2020. And we're looking at training in the winter of 2020 and into the spring of 2021. The time commitment for the training is one to three hours. If there are any questions, you can contact Linda Hockenberry at OEL. Thank you. So we are going to move on to our next topic and that's inclusion. Um, so Linda will be our presenter for the first subtopic, Autism Baby Navigator. Thank you, Chair. This is the Autism Baby Navigator. Um, the purpose of this is to engage with Florida State FSU College of Medicine um, with the Autism Institute to reach families of children with social communication delay and to support professional development of early learning coalition staff using technology supported platform called Baby Navigator. Um, the, another purpose is to offer the Baby Navigator technology supported platform for families to support their baby's early learning and nurture the development of language and success in school. To train early childhood educators and their home visiting partners to support families in using the Baby Navigator tools and resources. To develop the Baby Navigator mobile application to best serve families in low income and rural areas. Next slide. Strengthened, where anticipated outcomes are strengthened support to families to help monitor their baby's development, improved outcomes for children with social communication delays, and to ease navigation of services for families to catch delays early. The stakeholders are Early Learning Coalition, Early Childhood Educators, Home Visitors, and Families. Next slide. The activities are implementation of the Baby Navigator Educated Webinar Course. This is a seven-week series for 100 to 100 participants. Um, commencing in the winter of 2020 to provide online professional development course. It's called Social Communication Development in Infants and Toddlers, the winter of 2020, and to conduct infant toddler screens using the SoCal Cheka winter of 2020 and into the spring of 2021. Um, we're looking to begin early intervention referrals in the winter of 2020 into the spring of 2021 provide social communication growth charts, mobile application by spring of 2021. Next slide. The time commitment for training is the seven week live webinar series for the early childhood education teachers. Um, and also the FSU developed an online the social communication in infants and toddlers for professional development for early childhood educators, and this is self-paced. If there are any questions, I can be contacted at lynda.hockenberry at oel.myflorida.com. Thank you.
All right, thanks, Linda. So we are gonna move on to um, the work group and the tracking of early intervention services. Um, so Dr. Lisette Levy is gonna do the presentation for this. And um, Dr. Levy, if you can present your other topics, since you've got like four in a row, I'm just gonna let you go, okay? <laughs> Perfect, <laughs> thank you. Um, Courtney mentioned at the beginning of this webinar, the existence of a steering committee. When they got together, they also had conversations and concerns about um, screening in our state. There are several agencies that screen children in our state. And the reason why sometimes there can be some issues is because one agency might not know that the other one is doing it. So there is duplication and or sometimes when concerns arise, um, children are not offer the kind of supports that they need when delays are observed during this um, screening processes. So that is the need and the solution could be just to create a work group and the steering committee also proposed the solution. They wanted for us to organize a work group of many, many stakeholders, all of us that are um, related or do all the screening for children in Florida and um, talk to each other and be able to find out which are those challenges, which are those obstacles that are in the way for children and family not to get the help that they deserve. And at the same time, um, part of the issue is that we all are doing all the screenings and we all have all these different systems where we enter all this information, but agencies do not have access to other agency systems. So, OEL might not know what Help Me Grow is doing or what BEES is doing or what other agencies are doing. So they wanted for us to also to engage somebody to help us and find an early intervention services um, system that could work by putting together all that information in there. So. The University of Florida was engaged for helping us doing these two tasks. And next slide, please. Um, we want for the outcomes to be that they improve the efficiency and impact of the screenings, that the referrals for assessment for further diagnostic after the assessment happen is there and goes smoothly for parents and children. And um, identification of best practices in data, delivery system to ensure children getting the supports they need across multiple services providers. So you might be a family that is going through different agencies, but you never feel it because we are so well coordinated and communicating. And um, also, they want us to support the strengthening of transitions from Part C to Part B. All that is already happening, but um, they want it for us to do anything and everything that we can to support it. Next slide. So these are all the stakeholders. Don't worry, I'm not going to read them. Um, but they are about 18 or more of them that we are going to be engaging just to give you uh, an idea of um, all those representatives that are going to be part of the work group. Next slide. And this project is to be completed by December of 2020. And the activities that are about to start this uh, project has been executed, the contract, and so UF is starting to plan all these meetings, and there will be four virtual meetings with the stakeholders from July to November, and um, at the same time, UF will be conducting a, re a review 
of the literature um, at the statewide or nationwide or even worldwide that will find which is the best tracking system for us and will make a recommendation. If you have any comments, contact uh, me or questions, and I'll be happy to help you out. Our next topic, it is the Inclusion Collaboration Summits. And as I was telling you before, there are many of us, many agencies that work together um, to help children with special needs and any, any children um, really, but sometimes we have not been able to commun communicate with each other and collaborate with each other the way that needs to be so families and children are served better. So the, the idea was to start this group of interagency uh, stakeholders that we would get together and we have been getting together already for a year. We meet every week on Mondays at, um, I believe it's at one o'clock, and we have conversations and planning of what we should be doing so um, we all can collaborate better. And with PDG, we are able to use those funds to organize summits. And these summits are for strengthening the relationship of all of our partners. Next slide, please. So what we want to do really is to form a strong network for um, knowing each other at a very personal level, at the state level, and also try to bring together all the B workers that um, we have at the local levels. So under the transition to kindergarten um, is that we are doing this summit and it is to support transitions for children with unique abilities. And it could be from the private provider to the public provider, I mean, public school, I'm sorry. And so children get all the services that they need, no matter who are serving them. Next slide. Last year, I mean, I'm sorry, this year in uh, February, we had our first conference and it was attended by around 200 people or more. And the feedback that we got was that people was very excited to get with each other and learn from each other. So the anticipated outcomes for this project is to continue that work and expand the focus on inclusion and children with unique abilities. It is also to increase the collaboration with inclusion partners and the creation and support of the state leadership team that I just described for you across agencies responsible for serving children with special needs. Also, we want to identify solutions that can create and, and enhance coordination and collaboration across the program and services for these families and so that children with special needs have better outcomes. Next slide. For this purpose, uh, we have the ELC inclusion specialists. We also have the ELC's uh, program managers, that's what we call them, and those are the people at the coalition level that are knowledgeable about all of our programs. We also are engaging the pre-K contacts from the school districts. We are working with um, BEES, uh, DOE, and TAT, which is part of BEES, Fiddlers, and in the near future, we will start collaborate, collaborating also with early steps. The activities, it is to have one of these conferences um, every year. And sometimes if we can do it virtual, we might even have more than one, maybe one in the spring, one in the fall. Um, so 
So far this year, we'll have the one in February and we have planned one for October and we're working on it. Next slide. So if, um, if you or you or your staff wants to attend, uh, this year will be October 26th to the 28th. It will be four hours per day virtually and it will start at nine and end at 11.30 and we're planning for next year and the, the year after. And you can contact me or Katie Duffer Melendez if you have any questions. Moving on with our next topic. It's one of my favorites, the pyramid model implementation. And um, basically along the years, we have been reading research that says that expulsion and suspension of children uh, has increased in preschool more than what it happens in other stages of development. And so when trying to answer to this need, um, the pyramid, the implementation of the pyramid model can be the solution. The pyramid model is not only a training that you do. The pyramid model is a whole framework. It's a whole way in which you organize your early learning um, center and how you support your teachers, how you design your environment, how you communicate with the children. And yes, there is a lot of professional development that happens, but it has to be done in conjunction with other these other supports for the whole site. Um, we believe that when well implemented, the pyramid model really helps teachers and children communicating better and creating a sanctuary in their classroom for children to feel safe and for teachers to understand and communicate well with their students. So the ratio that you see in this slide of um, expulsions is not as outrageous as you can see it is in children of color. So next slide. The purpose uh, for this project is to engage the University of South Florida who is going to provide expertise and, uh, and help us, the Office of Early Learning, with creating the structure for the implementation of the pyramid model. Next slide, please. This is what our pyramid model will look in Florida. We had our first leadership team meeting, which it is the, the structure that supports the whole visual. And it was, it is created and uh, we're invited all kinds of stakeholders that are helping us to be successful in this endeavor. The next um, structure is the community leadership teams and those will be at this district level and coalition level. And they are going to be supporting their, um, this initiative and, advising in which direction to move depending on the area and the needs of the area. The next structure is a co cohort of an impl implementation specialist and those would be the, the people that we will be supporting and preparing so they actually go and support, coach and prepare early learning providers to in the implementation of the pyramid model. All this is based on data and the, the, the exchange of knowledge that happens when you gather that data, you study the data, you and you provide supports. So this is the visual that will be guiding this initiative statewide. So far we have about um, 18 coalitions that want to participate in these coalitions. Uh, we will we'll be also engaging the Head Start partners and the school districts 
and um, have applied. They have applied for this and we're reviewing the applications and deciding who will be ready to start this endeavor. Next slide, please. So what we want to achieve is, uh, of course, an improved cross-system collaboration from all of us here at the state level and also at the local level. We want also to coordinate early childhood service deli delivery, delivery system, supporting positive physical, cognitive, and mental health development of young children. We would like to expand the use of the pyramid model framework in early childhood programs statewide. And we also would like to decrease suspensions and expulsions and support the social emotional health and well-being of children. Next slide, please. The activities uh, and time frame are for the three years duration of the grant. We started in 2020 and we will end in 2022. And for this year only, these are the kinds of trainings that our partners, partners and selected um, leadership teams and coalitions are going to go through. Some um, are about um, training in how to implement this, how to make it happen. And we will have another training that is in preschool practice, you know, for implementing the pyramid model in the in the classroom. Next slide, please. Our stakeholders are early learning coalition staff and the um, leadership teams that they form, Head Start grantees, pre-K contacts from the school districts. And Monique and I are the ones who you can contact if you have any questions or concerns. Next slide. And changing the subject totally to a different um, thing. The racial equity initiative, um, it is also something that was very needed in our state. Just as the expulsion and suspension of children were majorly happening in children of color, there are other issues that are happening in our state that need our attention. And um, therefore, um, based on the preschool development grant, we were exhorted to do something about it. So the next slide, we have created a task force that most of you are familiar with and with the purpose of working at the different inequities happening in our system. So early learning coalitions will work with an equity coach in doing a systematic examination of how vulnerable racial and ethnic groups will likely be affected by proposed actions or decisions. And I love this visual because you can see how equality and equity are not the same things. Some groups need much more than they would get in order to be at par with their counterparts. And so this hiring of coaches or all the initiatives that we're doing in terms of equity it is to examine our um, system and be able to help individual coalitions and partners to achieve that examination needed in order to move ra racial equity issues. A certification process also started in 2019. We invited uh, about 40 people to come to get start the certification. Um, and what we want is by next year, if COVID permits, for us to continue that certification. And I will talk to you about it in a little bit. Next slide. The anticipated outcomes is to establish a platform to collectively 
build a base of knowledge and understanding of issues related to race and class through a systemic analysis of child serving systems and their connection to all systems and institutions in the state of Florida. And that's where you will see that we have, uh, along with the task force, identified 10 um, challenges that we face here in your coalitions and areas, um, as well with some of our partners, that can range anything and everything from transportation all the way to inclusion uh, of children uh, with disabilities and so each area has their uh, priorities and they all very passionate about it so what we need is to identify this prioritize these and try to move them forward um, to solve them we also want to support um, vulnerable and underserved young children at risk at risk and school failure by addressing policies, laws, systems, and practices that produce inequitable outcomes. And that is why the coaches that we are hiring for helping coalitions um, are going to be focusing along with the coalition in creating a project plan to try to analyze what are these inequities, focus on them, and try to make changes. We also want to learn about the gaps in, in health, in achievement, in socioeconomic status, in race and demographics. We wanna, we wanna learn what are all these differences that we have in groups and how can we make them smaller. And the most important of all, after we do all this, we want to identify any policies, any actions that we might be doing that are um, excluding people or not thinking about these people in the way that we need to for achieving an equitable outcome for children. Next question, I mean, next slide. So our stakeholders are all the ELC's leadership teams, community partners, Head Start partners, the Association of Early Learning Coalition, the Florida Head Start Association, and the time frame um, for the start and end of this is from 2020 to 2022. Um, right now, the work has started, leadership teams are meeting, and um, they keep on scheduling more meetings, doing a lot of homework, if you and your group or your coalition is not part of this initiative yet, please feel free to contact me and or Antrika Morgan, and we will uh, put you to start in January. Next slide. Usually the time commitment, it is two hours a month, except the begin, the, the first meeting, which um, can be up to three hours, just because you're gonna get to know your coach, you're gonna get to um, decide the rules of the game, and then start planning for the future of how you are gonna be working with your coach. But after that, um, usually you will be meeting with your coach for two hours, unless that you have to be working with your team internally, doing some homework or whatever you decide to do for your project plan. And that is the contact information, which is myself and Antrika Morgan. And I think uh, with this concludes my part of the presentations. Thank you very much. All right, well, thank you, Dr. Levy. So we're gonna move on to our third and final topic, which is social, emotional, and mental health. And we're gonna start off with Monique Wilkinson um, with the School Readiness Department, presenting on FSU's 10 Components of Quality. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Monique Wilkinson, and I am the program lead for the 10 Components of Quality Infant and Toddler Care Initiative. Uh, this project is an expansion of the initiative that began last summer. Uh, with the Train the Trainer, 
And our purpose, as you can see on the screen, um, to provide a path for programs to improve the quality of their infant toddler programs and also align all of our infant toddler initiatives underneath a single research-based tool. Uh, many of you may remember the tree graphic or the umbrella graphic that we have used in prior presentations and uh, to represent the fact that the 10 component system is uh, a framework that really does unite all of the work that, that you all are doing and that OEL is doing for early childhood programs in the state of Florida. Uh, the three activities associated with this project uh, are um, to provide a standalone training on the 10 component signs of quality observation tool, uh, to provide virtual technical assistance and coaching to not only the uh, FSU approved 10 components trainers that went through the, that have gone through the uh, train the trainer so far, but also anyone else who is trained um, underneath this initiative. And also very exciting to streamline all of the, our program data by integrating the 10 component signs of quality tool into the QPS. Next slide, please. So our anticipated outcomes um, are again to improve infant toddler program quality. Uh, we've heard for many years that there's just not enough out there to support infant toddler programs. And so when we had an opportunity to engage Florida State to provide 10, 10 components training and support, we, we went for it. Um, and we all know that when infants and toddlers are in high quality programs, that their social emotional development and their mental health is greatly supported and improved. So the stakeholders in this project are all of our infant toddler specialists at the coalitions, uh, trainers, uh, coaches, and the program managers. Um, the time frame for this project is uh, still under development. We're finishing up the details, but we're hoping to get started as soon as possible. And this project will run through June 30th of next year. Next slide. The time commitment for each one of the activities is listed here. Uh, the standalone training on the signs of quality tool will be 12 hours over two days, and that will be virtual. Uh, there will be 10 technical assistance webinars offered at one and a half hours per session. And then FSU is contracted to provide up to 75 hours of virtual coaching sessions. And they are going to be developing the uh, mechanism to register for those coaching sessions. So um, if you feel like you need some um, individual coaching or if your 10 components team at your ELC would like to meet with FSU as a group, you will be able to do that. And so once that mechanism is developed, um, we will be uh, forwarding that information to you. Uh, the contacts uh, for this project are, again, myself and also Lisette Levy. So if you have any questions about this project, please feel free to get in touch. Thank you. And thank you to Monique. So we are going to move on to infant early mental health. Um, with Katie Dufford Melendez. And Katie, since you're doing the last two, I'm just going to let you roll on into the next one as well, okay? Nope. Can you unmute her? Hold on. Hold on a second, Katie. Can you hear me now? Absolutely. All right. That's like a bad telecom commercial, isn't it? Can you hear me now? <laughs> I sure wish I could see your faces because it's not so much fun just looking at my picture on the screen. But hello, I'm Katie Dufford Melendez. I am with the School Readiness Program. And the great news from my little perspective of the world is how much work we have been doing, hopefully, to serve children and the Office of Early Learning's commitment to healthy social emotional development in young children. And as some of you all are um, aware, last year with the PDG, we were kind of really looking at what we could do to help promote um, the FAME endorsement process. And when we spoke to people involved, they said reflective supervision hours, and so we rolled out a bunch of ideas, and then we kind of hit a little hiccup. But the good news is on that is I think that pause in our work gave us a chance to reframe what we were trying to do so that we could come at it at a more uh, broad approach. So with the PDGR, there are four projects related to the infant early childhood mental health. 
The first one is an infrastructure study. So we wanted to look at what is in place across the state. We have contracted with the University of South Florida, Dr. Marshall and Dr. Pinto. They finalized their questions that will focus on um, identifying services, providers, and supports that are available statewide and locally. They are outlining uh, levers that are in place for support, such as funding and community agencies and grants. They're looking at gaps in services um, and to see if there are any deserts within our state, which I'm sure you guys already know there are. Um, spoiler. Um, and finally, they're um, going to meet with specialists across the state to get their recommendations on how we can make sure that our statewide infrastructure is in place. So the study questions have been finalized and the anticipated end date to the study is going to be December of this year. The next piece is the Florida Association for Infant Mental Health. They have an endorsement, the Florida Infant Mental Health Endorsement. You can go to their website, fame.org, to learn more about them, but they basically have four categories of endorsement, and the first two relate probably most to our field and those that we're looking most towards getting people endorsed in. Um, so just a little bit of background and a tiny bit. In order to be endorsed, it takes about a year for the process to complete. You'll do your own self-assessment on the kinds of um, education that you've had in the, your professional experiences related to early childhood mental health. And then also there's a piece on reflective supervision. We are working with uh, Lisa Negrini and Dr. Ann Hogan to um, contract some of the reflective supervision hours and to work with people who are interested in the endorsement process. It takes about 25 hours of reflective supervision. We're looking at one to two hours a month until people can complete their 25 hours. Um, and in order to become a reflective supervisor consultant, which is kind of the next step up, and it means that you can then provide those same service hours to people in your local community, it requires a little bit more time. So we're looking at that as well. We're finalizing the details with them, and we hope to begin this work in September. Let's see, what's next on my list? Um, as I mentioned, the FAME endorsement looks at the work experience and the educational experiences. They have a list of competencies that they want you to reflect upon to see how well you, you meet them. And in relation to that, uh, last year we worked with the University of Florida to create a 20-hour mental health course. And we contracted with a uh, FAME endorsed person named um, Deborah Goldberg, who reviewed all of our reviewed the course to see how it aligns with their competencies. We are also providing uh, scholarships and stipends to help people get the, meet the educational requirements of this work. And um, finally, we are working with FAME to consider what are the educational opportunities in our field and how they align with their competencies and how can we help you all obtain those um, educational backgrounds. And if you already have receive those classes, um, how does it align with the endorsement process? So um, next slide, please. The anticipated outcomes are training to prepare stakeholders to earn the same endorsement, the increased number of professionals with the endorsement, and hopefully our ultimate goal is to have children with improved physical and mental health. Next slide, please. Finally, um, related to early mental health, but not necessarily the endorsement process, OEL recently announced grant opportunities for coalitions to identify and purchase needed social, emotional, and or mental health support for families in school readiness and um, voluntary preschool providers. So um, you should have seen that email already go out. Um, we're working on the final details of the application process and more information will go out soon. And that's what I saw. Oh, those are the, the purposes of to be available to early learning coalitions, uh, Redlands Christian Mindgun Association, as I mentioned, to identify and purchase the supports needed and uh, the outcomes. Thank you. Oh, I forgot this piece, I apologize. The timeframe on that is intended to be September, 
through December, and we anticipate there being some carryover timeline on that. Um, the time commitment is dependent upon your particular project and what you propose in the application. All right. No, I thought really. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you, Katie. Um, and just to be clear, um, the social, emotional, and mental health support um, that is a separate grant than um, the Florida Association of Infant Mental Health Work that Katie was talking about earlier. Um, so these dates here and these stakeholders are specific to that mental health and social emotional support grant. Um, so that is it for our presentations for today. Um, I'm gonna, you got your mask on. I'm gonna mm -hmm, take yeah. mine off for a second. Um, that is it for today. So we're, we are gonna do questions. I did want to, um, to just let you all know though that we will um, put the questions in a question and answer and provide those at a later time for you all so that you have those answers that we've provided today. Um, Katie and the team are also working on some information sheets that we will provide after the second webinar um, to all of you so that you have the information. You will have the slides after this um, webinar. We'll provide those to you. And then those information sheets will give you more information that you need um, about these particular projects. And those should be ready um, by the end of webinar two, um, which is August 25th. And that's on another slide that's coming. But um, I'm gonna start with the questions that are in the questions box that have not been answered yet. And then we'll look to see if there's any hands raised that want to be unmuted to ask a question. Um, Lisette, if you can unmute your phone because the first three questions, I believe, are for you. Um, we will try to answer as many as we can, but if we don't know the answer, we will take the questions back and they will be in the question and answer document later. So, Lisette, are you unmuted? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so the first question is, is training going to continue for Pyramid virtually? We are waiting for December in Palm Beach. Um, okay, so when they say training for the pyramid model, I'm assuming that they're talking about the modules, which is the content of the pyramid model. There would be um, a training on, on the preschool part of the modules, but this training that um, we are talking about is more about teaching coalitions and teaching us how to implement this framework statewide to transform early learning centers into pyramid model early learning centers. Um, if they want to contact me directly and have a conversation, I think, uh, we will be able to clarify more points. Okay. The next question is um, from Tony Lupe, is how are you measuring reduced expulsions? That okay. was in one of the anticipated outcomes um, that came from the State Advisory Council. Yes, and Tamara, if you wanna help me out with this one, if I'm not saying it correctly, but I think um, through EFS, we will be able to kind of follow which children have been expelled. Um, I don't know if you know more about that, but I think it was about a, putting a code. And um, also the way that the pyramid model works is that you have behavioral uh, forms that teachers will be following challenging behaviors in the classroom as part of the data collection of every day. And the idea is that less and less of these challenging behaviors and therefore expulsions and suspensions start this, um, happening as the pyramid model is implemented correctly. And you are correct. So we um, we were working on updating those codes in EFS um, so that we can 
we can get some proper data on why children are leaving the programs. Um, that way we'll know um, why children are being um, withdrawn or expelled. And then the next question, Lissette, is when will we know if our application is approved for the pyramid model implementation project? We are meeting with the state leadership team. We decided that we wanted to do that uh, together. So we are meeting next week, and that's when all that process is going to happen. Most likely, everybody will be admitted. We just want to make sure that whoever is applying, um, you have everything that takes to support this effort. And if you don't, we will have conversations with you to see how we can support you better. All right, great. So I've got one more for you. And Katie, you might want to chime in on this. Um, there were a number of projects listed under inclusion and a few more under mental health. Is the expectation that this program and initiatives be offered, these programs and initiatives be offered by coalition staff and inclusion departments? Um, Katie, you want me to start and then you continue? Sure, that sounds great. Okay, so the vision for the inclusion program, um, it, it changed a few years ago. We went from just being the warm line, just um, uh, um, people answering phone calls and helping people. We went from that to becoming a program. And what that means is that we offer much more than just technical assistance. We are the ones who identify certain needs in the classroom, whether they are at the child level or at the, at the environment level. And based on that is that we call in other parts or other programs in the coalition, like the coaching or training, to help um, the environment, for example. So to provide um, professional development to the teachers so they can um, meet the needs of every child. And so mental health, um, it is under the umbrella of inclusion, um, but we sep sometimes we separate them just so uh, we understand better or we can manage better the projects, but we don't really see it as two separate things, um, inclusion, includes mental health. And I'm going to let um, uh, Katie also tell tell you their, her point of view. I, thanks, Lisa. I think, um, you know, what it's been, gosh, probably a year and a half now since we, through the inclusion process, were able to visit you all. And if you recall, I was fairly new at the time and really trying to learn kind of how ELCs work. And I did learn that they are huge in size and small in size. And no matter what, people wear multiple hats. And it really is up to the executive directors and the project managers to determine the best way to allocate your resources and your most valuable resources, the time of people. So that said, it really is going to wind up falling upon you all to decide what's best for your coalition. I would say as far as the endorsement process, there's almost two different levels there and two different tracks. There's um, the first category, I mentioned there were four, and the first two are the ones that really relate to our field. And the first one is for people to be able to, to reflect upon how our daily decisions, how our practices, how our experiences influence how we look at the classroom learning environment and what we bring into the classroom as we're making decisions for children and how we teach them. The other level of that is really to be able to support staff as they do just that with their first level. So the reflective supervision consultant is the one that is gonna help other professionals think through their practice. So to me, in some cases that could be a coach, in other cases it could be your inclusion director, it could be your program manager, someone that you think is going to be invested in growing the field in your area, if that helps. Anything else to add, Tamara, Lisa? No, I think that was great. And I just want to just mention that the majority of our projects are volunteer.
voluntary. And so they're not things that you have to participate in if you don't have the capacity. They will make a difference in the programs. And so we do recommend these initiatives that um, are being implemented through the BDG, but they are voluntary. Um, thank you guys so much. Um, if you can, uh, Monique, if you can unmute your phone, I have one question for you, and then I'll go to the hands that are raised. Sure, go ahead. Okay, it says, how does the 10 components align with infant toddler class? That is an excellent question. Um, the infant toddler class would fall into, I believe, component six, which is active and responsive caregiving. So as we've mentioned in previous presentations and at our retreat last year, you know, the 10 components really does provide an umbrella for all of the other initiatives that we do at OEL. So it's not another thing to do. It's just a framework that we can use to organize all the work that we're currently doing. But uh, whoever asked that question, feel free to shoot me an email and I'd be happy to have a conversation with you about that to make it more clear or to help you feel more comfortable uh, with uh, the plan that we have and the vision that we have. All right, and I have one more for you as well um, that just came while you were speaking. So it says okay. three T programs state is part of any of the infant and toddlers initiatives. This is Maria Gutierrez. Can, can you repeat that for me, Tamara, please? Sure, it says three T program state is part of any of the infant and toddlers initiatives. It looks like something might be missing, but. I can unmute her. She's unmuted. She wants to... um, Maria Gutierrez is unmuted. Yes. All right. Hi. Hi, how are Hi. you, everybody? I'm sorry. Uh, the program, the three T's. This is uh, in Palm Beach, we running a 3 ts program. This is for infant and toddlers. I understand it's part of the initiative for infant and toddlers. This is my question. Uh, All right, well, we're gonna unmute Monique. Yeah. Molly, Molly said she can answer that question if you want her to. Yeah. Oh, sure, go ahead. Okay, Hi, Molly. so Molly, if you can unmute Molly, she said she can help because she's running the 3 ts for the ELC. Uh -huh. Hold on one second, Molly. You're self-muted, Molly. You should be able to unmute. Yep. Molly? She has three. Yeah, she's, you might want to unmute them all. All right, okay. so can you guys hear me? <laughs> yes, is that Molly? Hey, it's Molly. Yeah, the, so the Three T's initiative is actually, it's a separate project that's being funded through the AELC and the PNC Bank. It's an initiative that's coming down through ELCs, but it's, um, the way I would liken it to is kind of like Broom, where it's a framework for families to use when they're interacting with their children for through three. Um, so the Three T's, it's tune in, talk more, and take turns. And um, it's something that Again, through PNC Bank, we're working with 15 coalitions throughout the state to bring that initiative to parents and families. So it's completely separate and unrelated to anything that is PDG. Thanks, Molly. And yeah, that's no something problem. that would fall in, in, under the component for uh, for language development. So, right. All right, thank you. And so um, I'm going to unmute Beatrice. Bastante, and you guys forgive me if I pronounce your names wrong. You are welcome to announce yourself. Um, Beatrice, you are muted by yourself if you can unmute yourself. Okay, so we will move on to, um, to Karen Willis. Karen, I'm unmuting you, and then you can just unmute yourself if you want to ask your question. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate you guys sharing all of your plans on this. And while they are very exciting, um, I think we should be very cognizant that this one of these initiatives rests on the back of early childhood teachers who are primarily women of color who make between eight fifty and twelve bucks an hour. So that, in my opinion, is the largest inequity issue we have in the state. So my question is, among these various initiatives, are there um, incentives for participation? And what are the thoughts about ongoing financial supports for teachers? Thanks for taking my question. 
You're welcome. Thank you, Karen. So the ongoing financial supports, I'm going to have to put that one off. I can't really answer that question. Um, some of these projects do offer incentives. Um, there are stipends, um, and I believe there's stipends in a few of the projects. Um, with the Baby Navigator project, I believe that there are stipends and computers, I believe, that are part of that project. And so we are looking at ways to incentivize um, participation um, in these particular projects of ours. Because we do hear you, and we are very much aware that, um, that a lot of these things are about the, the training of the, the early learning educators and across the state that are working um, in school readiness and that their pay is very low. Um, I do believe that if, if we work well with the coalitions and the staff that are coaching the, um, the child care providers, that there is a way to make the work more efficient using some of these project initiatives that we are implementing that may make their work a little bit easier um, than it is now. And when I say easier, I don't mean reducing workload, but um, setting up efficient processes to deal with behavior, um, social, emotional um, learning. There's opportunities for the teachers to get additional training and professional development to build their skills. And so um, those thoughts are in our mind as well. And we encourage those that are participating in the equity coaching project um, to look at this issue as part of one of the things that they cover that you cover when you're doing your planning work with your equity coach. Tamara, can I add to what you just said? Yes, ma'am. I would like to add that. Um, all, uh, many of these initiatives are interrelated to what we already have in rule. And for example, the pyramid model will have a direct effect on the class and, and the class scores of teachers. And so if you implement the pyramid model in your early learning center, and then you are observed by the class tool, most likely your scores will go up. And if they go up, they would put you at a different differential um, than you are at um, through the program assessment initiative that we have. So that money doesn't go directly to the teachers. Like you just said, we're not actually uh, bringing up their salaries, but these initiatives do support the class assessment in that way. So differentials um, get greater. Thank you, um, Dr. Levy. I appreciate that. So I'm going to unmute Tony. Um, and you are also self-muted if you can unmute yourself. Uh-oh. Thank you. And this is not Tony. This is actually Lindsay Carson, but Tony <laughs> was kind enough to share his link because I lost it. So full disclosure, my comments come from Lindsay not Tony. There, you're off the hook, Tony. Um, first of all, thank you guys so much. I'm so excited about all of this work. Um, I know that this has been a Herculean effort during a difficult time, and it's really encouraging to have something positive to be looking at. So thank you guys for your efforts. Um, I know that we've talked a lot about some of the programmatic initiatives, and, and there's some different grants that are coming down with those. I think that's great. Part of the project about a part of the, the the part about this project rather that I'm so excited about is the systemic alignment. So you guys are doing a lot of work at the state level to bring together these different agencies and organizations to fix the structural barriers and the policy challenges that we have to providing equitable opportunities for our kids um, across domains. At the local level, this work really aligns with what some of us have tried to get started in terms of collective impact at the local level. Um, but the coordination, you know, that the, we need in order to bring all those partners together at the ground level to make the big vision that's coming from this state task force happen is going to require some additional bandwidth. 
And I think coalitions are very uniquely positioned to have that statement, that, that broader mentality, but also bring it to reality on the front line. And so my question really is, has there been any consideration or could there be consideration for some grant funding to pay essentially for staffing that would help us to increase our bandwidth to help with some of that community coordination with our partner agencies to make these things actually come to fruition and execute the planning that you guys are doing? That is an excellent question, Lindsay, and um, I will um, take that question back and have that discussion with Courtney and Kat and Shan, because um, I can't answer that right now um, because of the way that um, the grant works, um, the grant money works, but I can definitely have that conversation, especially with Courtney, who is the staff director for PDG. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, I am unmuting Tia Walton Walker if you want to ask your question. Yeah, but it's another second for unmuting. Okay. And I believe that that is the last hand raised. <laughs> so we don't have any other questions. However, um, we will be sending out this PowerPoint um, after this webinar is over. The contact um, leads are in the webinar along with their email addresses. Please feel free to email them your questions if you have anything additional. And um, you are also welcome to email me, Tamara.price at oel.myflorida.com. Um, I can also assist with answering any questions or any ideas that you guys might have um, beyond this. And it's amazing that we got through all of those projects <laughs> and the questions in 90 minutes, but we are done and we are so glad that you guys joined us today um, to learn about these initiatives. And we will see you guys or talk to you all on August 25th um, from 1.30 to 3. And that is it. Unless, Adia, do you have anything you want to add? Nothing said. Thank all you right. all. For you all have a great day. Bye-bye.